um, put both of these talks together. And as you heard, I'm actually a neurologist by training, and I practice neurology. My main focus of my research is actually central nervous system effects of HIV. I was here a few years ago actually talking to your group about um, issues of cognition and uh, CNS infection with HIV. But I think that um, as my work has focused more and more on persistence of HIV in the brain, my interests have become um, really uh, involved in looking at HIV reservoirs and cure. And so I've had the benefit of being able to uh, participate in, collaborate on, co-lead a number of different studies on HIV cure. And so I think my perspective on this talk is a little bit different from a dyed-in-the-wool HIV cure researcher. Not all my funding comes from HIV cure research. Um, and I think I, I'm hoping to present some of the issues with, I think, probably the appropriate ambivalence, maybe, that some of these topics deserve. Um, and it also means that a lot of these slides are lent or provided by a lot of my colleagues in HIV Cure, specifically Jintanat Anawarnich, who also has visited here, um, and Steve Deeks, again, a long-term collaborator from my UCSF days, who are both major leaders in the real field of HIV Cure. Um, but I'm going to start by just giving you an outline of what I wanted to try to cover today. And this is really actually in response to what you guys requested. And I'm hoping that I can get through these topics in a way that puts them in perspective um, and, and raises questions. And starting with sort of very basic semantics, what do we mean by the term HIV cure? Why do we pursue the goal of HIV cure, given that we have such good treatments and many people are living almost healthy lives or essentially healthy lives with long-term treatment? Have there been examples of true cures? We'll talk about that. And then stepping back, going to the biology a little bit of HIV infection and the natural history of, of the virus, why is it so difficult to cure HIV? Why can't we simply just give people medications and make it go away? <clears throat> and then I'm gonna cover some of the strategies and approaches that are being studied or have been studied in these efforts to cure HIV. And then we're going to step into things that I think are a little bit more discussion points or controversial areas. And so one of these is, why is it that we use treatment interruption in HIV cure studies? Because this has been an area that has been hotly debated in terms of its safety, its ethics. Um, but from the HIV cure field perspective, it's thought of as being essential to assess the effect of cure strategies. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then I'm going to end with some of the ethical and social challenges that um, I think are perceived by investigators, perceived by the community, um, and that I think we should discuss and also will be followed up in on Gail's talk um, uh, following mine. So to start out, let's just talk about definitions. What is meant by HIV cure? And I'm going to use HIV cure, the term, throughout my talk, but it's really sort of used as a very specific terminology in two different ways. So some people talk about HIV eradication. HIV eradication is the goal of basically um, expelling every single integrated um, HIV genomic material from the body that could potentially reactivate and replicate itself. So the idea is that if you have HIV, you're not just going to suppress it with medications, but you're actually going to rid the body of all of the different cells that actually are harboring long-term HIV. And this is an incredibly difficult task. And basically, all of the HIV cure strategies right now in use aren't even really even trying to accomplish this eradication. Um, there has probably been one case, perhaps, of true HIV eradication that's definitely, I think, with long-term follow-up, seems to be persistent. And this is of Timothy Ray Brown, the Berlin patient who received a stem cell transplant from someone who lacked the surface receptors that are co-receptors that are required for entry of the HIV virus into cells. So if you think about a stem cell transplant, basically what you do with someone with a stem cell transplant is you completely obliterate their own immune system. You get rid of all of the immune cells in the body, theoretically, that would be hosting HIV. And then you replace those with the immune cells of another individual. And the reason that this is such an incredibly powerful way to address this issue is that if you have latent viruses hidden in immune cells, you've basically turned over the whole population of immune cells. But by the same token, you can imagine this is an unbelievably risky treatment. And in his case, he had this stem cell transplant because he had a fatal leukemia diagnosis, AML, um, which ended up being cured with the stem cell transplants, although he required two. But stem cell transplant is an incredibly dangerous 
um, procedure to go through and there's about a 30% mortality rate. And so this is a very, very dramatic way that you can potentially eradicate HIV from the body. Um, the, other, the other way that people think about HIV cure, and I think this is probably the goal or the term we should be using more when we talk about HIV cure, is what's, what's termed HIV remission, or some people are calling it HIV control. And this is basically people who may have HIV hiding in some cells still in the body, but they're able to control the virus so that it doesn't replicate. And many of the ways that this would be thought to be done would be to be through perturbing the immune system, so the immune system can control and prevent virus from replicating itself. And in this, in this case, the way it would be defined would be by taking just a regular blood test, checking for a regular clinical viral load, and not finding a quantifiable viral load in the blood. But it wouldn't necessarily necessitate that every single cell in the body no longer had HIV genetic material in it. This would be important because it would mean there's no transmission of HIV. Someone living with HIV remission, it would be the untransmissible means, uh, I mean, undetectable means untransmissible. You wouldn't be able to transmit the virus. Um, and it would be equivalent to people that now, the rare of like 0.05% of people who have elite control, so basically people who have HIV, but um, endogenously are able to somehow with their immune systems or other, other ways that are not well understood, control HIV and not have viral replication. Um, the caveat with HIV remission is that we don't know necessarily with long-term HIV remission, where HIV may still be hiding in some cells of the body, whether there may not be some still long-term consequences of that low level of virus in the body. We know that many elite controllers um, have long, long, healthy lives without any disease progression. But some elite controllers, despite undetectable viral loads, actually do have CD4 decline. They do have some disease progression. They do have abnormal immune activation. And there may be long-term consequences of that. So this is sort of my caveat that remission may not actually be, even though it would mean people didn't need to take medications, they may not be actually as 100% healthy as they would be if they didn't have HIV. Um, so the next question is, you know, HIV cure is this lofty goal, and I'm going to talk about the incredible efforts, both investigatively in terms of study participants and community members, and in terms of funding, funding agencies, how much effort is being put towards HIV cure. But why is this so important? Why do we need to do this? We have treatments that work. We have treatments that are keeping people um, having very long, very healthy lives almost equivalent, um, close to equivalent uh, life expectancy of people living without HIV, many people with great quality of lives, working well, uh, doing fine on few pills a day and with the long-term injectables coming along the pipeline, even easier treatment and adherence. So why is it being pursued? And I think there's two perspectives there. There's the individual perspective and there's the sort of public health societal perspective. And um, this is a slide kindly provided to me by Steve Deeks, which I think is a really moving slide. This is um, a, it's a cloud ribbon put together with statements that were identified in interviewing many, many people living with HIV about what a cure would mean to them. And you can kind of see certain words in there, no side effects, acceptance, trust, freedom, no more stigma, Etc. These were terms that came up over and over again, and I think these are things that are really important on the individual level, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows. Um, and then here are some direct quotes from a, a study. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Dubay, who's at University of North Carolina, did a, this study where she did a kind of qualitative assessment and interviewed individuals. And these are some of the quotes. A life free of stigma, secrets, and medication mean that I would not think of myself as tainted anymore and could feel more at ease with others, which I find particularly moving, and, um, and then a more practical one, just the medications. Freedom to go on a long vacation for more than 30 days without worrying about running out of medications. And I'll say in my clinic, people all the time come in and say, you know, I missed my meds for a week because I went to Mexico and I forgot to take them or something like that. So these are both the sort of emotional and practical issues I think that people feel on an individual basis. And this is another sort of amalgamation of different types of statements or different kinds of thoughts that people have. You may not be able to read all of these, but they, they span everything from um, sort of pride and identity. I had the courage to seek treatment and care. I'm proud to help my peers living with HIV. These are people who are living with HIV. Um, but there's also issues here, which are some of them are issues in the United States. I face discrimination from health staff. I feel like I have no one who understands. My family may reject me. 
two things that I think are even probably more true in countries outside of the United States, such as I'm criminalized um, and I'm scared that I will lose my job. So for example, in Thailand, where I do a lot of my work, it's not legal to require an HIV test for employment, but many, many sites of employment still get around loopholes and require an HIV test for employment. And I'll actually get to that towards the end when I talk about some of the negative effects of treatment interruption, which is something we experienced directly in one of our Thai trials. Um, but I would say the other things that just my patients say to me in clinic are these basic things, medication side effects, cost of medications. My immune system isn't completely recovered despite the fact that I'm taking my treatment perfectly. I have drug resistance, and then, of course, the big fear of HIV stigma. So I think these are some of the um, kind of personal things that are experienced by people, but we also know from a medical standpoint that just because people are on long-term suppressive therapy and very effective therapy that is preventing their CD4 necessarily from declining and preventing them from getting opportunistic infections and complications of AIDS, it doesn't mean that people have an, uh, in the same necessarily healthy lifespan as someone living without HIV. And increasing understanding has emerged that basically people living with HIV on treatment, undetectable viral loads, have increased levels of, for example, deleterious immune activation. So this is a schematic figure where in the black is shown the response of the plasma viral load to starting treatment, which is shown with the ART arrow, where you can see that the plasma viral load can go down and be undetectable. However, the other lines are showing the immune response. And an immune response, which was essentially normal before acquisition of HIV, very, very high levels of inflammation, soluble and cellular markers of inflammation before treatment, but that none of these actually completely normalize during therapy. And the concern is that there are long-term effects of a mildly activated immune system that have been recognized in the brain, in the heart, uh, the kidneys, bones, all of these um, have been increased in people even living with well, long-term, well-treated HIV, and I think emerging recognition that there are a lot of, quote, non-AIDS malignancies, which are also much higher prevalence. So even though we're treating people successfully, what we're doing with our treatment is not necessarily making everybody as healthy as they could be if they weren't living with HIV. And so these are sort of reasons that the idea of curing HIV and potentially getting rid of all of these things would be a real benefit to the individual. And then benefit from society is obvious, I think, clearly, despite the fact that we've had an enormous amount of effort and funding put towards treatment of HIV, prevention of HIV. 2016, there were still 2 million new infections worldwide. So what we're doing isn't enough to prevent the epidemic from ongoing. And again, all of you are very familiar with the HIV testing and care continuum. This is from the WHO data suggesting that even though we've had this massive rollout and efforts and research funding and um, uh, community efforts, only uh, less than half of the global population is on ART with suppressed viral load. So despite the fact that we have a lot of tools at our disposal to effectively treat HIV, we're not able to effectively treat HIV at this point based on financial issues, stigma issues, access to care issues, implementation science, et cetera. There are many, many barriers. So although we have treatments, our treatments aren't enough. And finally, there's obviously the financial aspect. And I was really struck. I saw Tim Horn recently give a talk where he showed the slide that the number one expense in USA Medicaid um, for medications is our HIV medications in the United States. Given we have such a small population compared to the global population in li living with HIV, are, are the biggest uh, bottom line dollar amount for, for medication prescriptions, more than cancer, more than inflammatory conditions, all of these things with really, really expensive treatments. But we have the benefit that people are living for a long time, so they need daily therapy with a duration of years, and therefore it's an enormous expense, of course. And this is the amount that was spent, $20 billion spent in um, 2017 on HIV medications, and if we were actually covering everybody to get to 73% viral load suppression, it would be $30 billion. So these are sort of the obvious basic reasons that we need, we need an HIV cure because this is unsustainable, certainly in our country and even more so worldwide. Does that include PrEP or no? This does not include PrEP. Yeah. Yeah. So, which is a, obviously a whole other thing, which is wonderful, but... 
Um, okay, so that's sort of setting the stage for I think there's convincing reasons that despite the fact that we have good treatments, we, we still do, the world would benefit from an HIV cure. But has anybody really been cured? And I think that this is, um, I think the jury's still out on some people, but there are sort of different ways of thinking about it. So we know, and this is a slide, a lovely slide from Jintanat. So we know that if people are um, treated with HIV, they'll have a suppressed plasma viral load. And if they interrupt therapy here at the stop sign, they basically have viral rebound within 14 to 21 days. And this is true universally pretty much, except for the very, very small number of people who have turned out to be elite controllers. Maybe they didn't know that when they started treatment or another group that I'll show you in a minute. Um, there have been some people who have had a delayed viral rebound after treatment interruption. And this is, I'm gonna talk about this issue when I talk specifically about treatment interruption. But one of the ways that we look for the evidence of an HIV cure is whether or not somebody can control viral replication when they're off therapy. So there are two individuals in Boston who received stem cell transplants for malignancies, where when they first interrupted therapy, they actually didn't require treatment and they had undetectable plasma viral loads. And there was a lot of excitement that maybe these individuals were also cured like the Berlin patient, who's shown here by the way, and who's been now 12 years, I think, since treatment interruption. Um, and however, the Boston patients were not transplanted with Delta 32 negative or CCR5 negative um, donors. They simply received you know, complete turnover of their immune system from somebody who didn't have HIV. And we don't know exactly why, but for whatever reason, these Boston patients did eventually rebound, although there was a delay compared to people without, each, without that. And then there have been some other accounts of individuals that have had a delayed viral rebound. So the San Francisco patient is an individual who started treatment. He was identified as positive during, a, during PrEP. He was so early that he was essentially considered like almost pre-diagnostic. He had such a low viral load. Started on treatment right away, was suppressed and then after being suppressed for, I think, two years, can't remember the number of years, interrupted therapy and clearly did have a delayed rebound. So he started therapy very early and he rebounded later than, than as usual. And then there's the famous Mississippi baby who, again, was hailed as a potential HIV cure when she was brought back to clinic having been off of therapy for a while, unbeknownst to her caregivers, and was undetectable for a long time. So she actually didn't rebound for almost two and a half years, and she was thought to hopefully also be an HIV cure until she rebounded. Again, she was started on therapy within the first hours of life. So this idea that very early treatment may be beneficial is something that's been caught on and I'll talk about when we talk about HIV cure strategies. And then there have been some other cohorts. The Visconti cohort um, is a group of people that started treatment early as well. And in that group, when people stopped therapy after starting early, a higher proportion than in the general population has been able to control HIV. They didn't start really, really early like the San Francisco or Mississippi uh, people. But um, in that group, they seem to find that people who started early had a higher chance of keeping HIV in remission. But those people have HIV detected in some of the cellular sites, they just don't have viral replication. And then down here is the Berlin patient that I mentioned. And there's one more patient who may be like the Berlin patient. London patient was reported at Croy in March, who, uh, similar to the Berlin patient, had a stem cell transplant from somebody who was Delta 32 CCR5 double negative. And as of 18 months, it had no viral rebound off of treatment. He hasn't had the same kind of deep interrogation yet that the Berlin patient has in terms of tissue sites and all of this. So we don't know for sure whether he's an eradication or just a controller. Question. I think it's so interesting that these are just single patients. Is that normal for finding a cure for diseases or is this an exception? This is an exception, I mean, I think. And in fact, the London patient, if you, if you talk to the people who do the study or read the paper, they have about, I think, 38 people that they've been following who have had these stem cell transplants. He's the only one who hasn't rebounded. Oh, so this is with yeah. the state-of-the-art stem cell transplant, Delta 32 negative, everything ideal. I may be wrong on the numbers, but it, it was about a larger cohort, and only one of them so far hasn't rebounded. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is you know, more than a needle in a haystack. This is the tiniest, tiniest drop in 75 million people who have had HIV, right? Um, so why is it so hard? Why is it this one or two examples? And why are these people rebounding despite looking like it's undetectable for a while or whatever? And I think um, that just goes to the biology of HIV. And, and, and many of you in the room probably know this, but I'm just gonna go quickly. 
how is it that, that HIV affects the body, right? Well, the way it works, HIV itself isn't really an organism. It's a, it's a capsule surrounding a bunch of genetic material. And the way that this capsule, this, this virus, makes more of itself, the way it's adapted to survive, is by integrating its genetic material into the host cell. In this case, with HIV, it's a human host cell. And putting its, its, its genetic material into the, the human host genetic genome, so when, um, and then hijacking sort of the replication mechanism of the human cell. So you have the, the pink is the HIV RNA, it's injected into the cell, it's turned into DNA by reverse transcriptase because our cells, of course, have DNA. And then the DNA is, is inserted into the human uh, DNA. So here's our DNA. The provirus is what it's called once it's in our cell, is then integrated. And then when the cell is activated, you end up having transcription of HIV RNA again. This goes into the cytoplasm. You start making the viral proteins. The virus is able to assemble itself into a new virus with all these components and release itself again. So this is the problem right here, which is that once it's in our cells, we can't just cut it out, or at least we haven't been able to so far. And this is why it's required, for example, stem cell transplants to basically wipe out all of the cells that had this in it in order to actually achieve an HIV cure. And our current medications, antiretroviral medications, um, almost exclusively attack different stages of the HIV life cycle in terms of that replication ability or the integration or whatever. But they don't, they, some of them are actually entry inhibitors, so they would prevent the virus from first entering a cell. But you'd have to be able to give somebody an entry inhibitor before they were ever exposed to HIV to prevent it from ever entering your cell. So our current medications can basically stop all those aspects of assembly, turning into a new virion, releasing from the cell, but they can't actually cut out the genome that's being inserted into the cell. And then how does it work that if you have cells that, have, that are HIV infected, how is it that you can have then persistence of the virus in these cells? And the main cellular reservoir that people talk about most of the time are CD4 T cells. I think that another cellular reservoir are myeloid cells. We have macrophages and microglial cells in the brain that are clearly infected by HIV. Um, but in the periphery and in lymph nodes, we, we think it's mostly a CD4 T cells. And there's sort of two ways you can think of an HIV reservoir. So a reservoir is technically defined as something that could not only, um, there, there's virus harbored inside the cell, but a reservoir would mean you could actually reseed the periphery. It can reactivate and come back out as an infection. So it can't just be silent and locked. And in this case, one possibility is that you have residual replication despite treatment. So even though you have people on ART, for some reason, even though it seems like the ART should be stopping new infections, somehow you do end up getting some new infections despite treatment. So there's residual replication. For whatever reason, the antiretrovirals aren't working very well. And you can imagine that in some protected compartments, such as the brain, where the drugs don't necessarily get in as well, and maybe the cell types are different, maybe you have some low-level residual viral replication. But most of what people focus on in terms of HIV cure is looking at HIV, latent HIV reservoir. And that is basically a, the integrated HIV, which is the, the solid part in the genome, simply stays in the cell and the cell can go through different cycles. So some T cells are long-lived and they just survive for a long time. And otherwise, T cells can proliferate or now we know can clonally expand. So this basically means that that same T cell can make more T cells that has exactly the same genome. So even though the, this T cell itself may not survive that long, it has product progeny T cells that still contain the HIV genome. So that if somebody survives for 40 years or 60 years living with HIV, they're gonna continue to have T cells that are harboring HIV. And so this is really the challenge that we have, is that these cells, at least those cells that have replication, may have surface markers or something else where we can identify those cells because they're producing HIV proteins and they can be recognized by the immune system. But these cells so far, we have not been able to necessarily identify. So it's very hard to identify which CD4 T cells may have infection. And in the human body, it may be only one in a million CD4 T cells, but we have millions and millions of CD4 T cells. So this is really the challenge that we have. The other thing that I would say, as I mentioned, is that there are, com there are other compartments, the brain, the lymph nodes, the intestines, the genital tract, 
And some of these have different penetrants of antiretrovirals because of different uh, barriers. And also, there may be other cell types, so macrophages and microglial cells, that may have special considerations and maybe even longer-lived cells. So microglia, for example, are embryonic-derived cells that are there and basically survive for the, the course of somebody's long-term life. Um, and here's a study. This is from an SIV model, so it's a non-human primate model. It's my only animal slide I'm going to show you. But this is a really nice uh, study looking at the distribution of where SIV RNA, so actually transcribed SIV, is um, identified in different tissues in macaques that have, um, have had iatrogenic SIV infection. And they show that on the untreated macaques, there is HIV, the SIV detected in all of these different tissues in the black bars. But during suppressive therapy, you can still detect this in almost in all of these different tissues. So it just tells us the magnitude of the problem. We're not just looking at one cell type. We're actually probably looking at tissues and cells throughout the body. And thinking about trying to ferret out all of those in order to eradicate HIV is just an insurmountable goal, I think. Where's LN? Is that lymph node? So lymph node. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes. Um, which is, you know, the major. This is the one yeah. we know about. But right. in fact, these other ones are impressive, right? Um, so. So because of that, I guess I'm trying to say that, that antiretroviral therapy is not enough. And once you stop ART, people have viral rebound. And they basically can have, I mean, I've, you, we've all had patients. I just took care of a patient last week who had toxoplasmosis. He went off therapy for nine months. And CD4 went from like 700 to like 72 in nine months because, you know, he had rapid viral replication. He'd had a super low CD4 nadir in the 1980s. And, you know, you just have progressive decline. So people, unfortunately, have to be in this for the long haul in order to stay as healthy as they can be. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about cure strategies. And um, I, think, I think this is just an important thing to kind of get a sense of if you're not really familiar with what these approaches are. So the main strategies um, are to reduce and control HIV reservoirs. So I'm not going to talk about stem cell transplant because that's basically really... Um, I think it is, it is being pursued, and this London patient shows there are still active studies doing this, and it still will be, I think, an important tool for somebody who maybe needs a stem, stem, stem cell transplant if, because they have a malignancy that requires that. But with the severe morbidity and mortality of that procedure, it's, it's um, not a viable option for the scalable. So early ART, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about what are called latency modifying agents. So I talked about the latent virus hidden within the cells. What could you do to control that virus? Either get rid of it or lock it in. I'm going to talk about that. Immune therapies are efforts to basically tailor or enhance the body's own immune response to be able to control virus and viral replication. And then there are some cell and gene-based therapies. So early ART, I mentioned um, the on the slide where I was talking about the different individuals with uh, uh, no rebound of treatment interruption. I mentioned the Visconti study. So these are people who um, interrupted therapy, I mean, sort of initiated therapy early after initial HIV infection. Um, they were not really, really acutely treated. These people were within like six to 12 weeks of getting HIV when they started treatment. Um, but there was this exciting observation that about 10% of these people um, who had been on therapy early and then stayed on therapy for a number of years actually when they interrupted therapy did have control of their virus. So this was kind of a really exciting finding and it made people think, well, wow, if we can systematically identify people very, very early, maybe we can increase that number. And even if it's earlier than the Visconti study, maybe we can make that better. The problems here are that the mechanism is unknown. It's clear that people who didn't have viral rebound had a, what was called a lower reservoir size. If you tried to measure, for example, the number of cells in the blood that had HIV integrated into them, that was a lower number that were positive for HIV DNA. Um, they also seemed to have lower kind of inflammatory responses and better preserved immune systems. But how to kind of recreate that or how to optimize that is, is really the challenge. Um, so that, so the, the findings of the Visconti study led to a lot of excitement about early and acute HIV infection and treating people very early. And I mentioned that, for example, the Mississippi baby was another example of a very, very early treatment that looked really promising for a while. So this is Gentinot's work, and this is um, uh, based on a study you're going to hear more about from Gail this, uh, after my talk, 
which is an acute HIV cohort based in Bangkok in Thailand, where individuals are identified through um, routine STD and HIV testing at the largest uh, anonymous HIV testing center in Asia, which is in Bangkok, right next door. It's a, the um, Thai Red Cross right next door to our research center there. And individuals are identified extremely early because we're also testing, we're screening all of those samples for um, HIV RNA, not just the antibody test. So anybody who's antibody negative but RNA positive ends up being asked if they want to join the study. So people start therapy at a median about 19 days after estimated infection. So some people are starting therapy within five days after estimated infection. It's incredibly early. And it's, it's a really unique study. There's now about 600 people with acute HIV who have been enrolled. They're offered immediate therapy, and 95% of them have started therapy immediately. Um, so, so because it was such a unique opportunity to study a large number of people with very, very acute treatment, um, these investigators decided that it was a valid and important experiment to ask, well, possibly since these people started so early, could they be post-treatment controllers like the Visconti patients? These people were starting way earlier than the Visconti people. So they um, identified people who had FIBIG-1 infection. So that means the very earliest, there's sort of a five-stage process in timing acute infection all before seroconversion. FIBIG-1 is they just have an RNA positive. They don't have a P24 antigen. They don't have any antibody responses. They're so early. And so eight individuals were consented to stay on therapy for more than two years. And then after they were on therapy, they were asked if they would be willing to interrupt therapy. And you're going you're to hear a lot more about this from Gail. But the hope was that these people would be post-treatment controllers, and none of them were. So this is the weeks after treatment interruption that you saw viral rebound. One of them virally rebounded at one week even though they had started therapy within the first you know, seven days or so of HIV. So this was a really crushing blow, I would say, to the, all of the efforts at early uh, treatment, and, um, and it, I would say to Jintanad and to those of us who were involved in this study, because we were really hoping we were going to benefit these individuals. Um, but it does tell us that early treatment is not enough. There were some people who seemed to have a little bit of a delay, but you know, one or two people, again, it's hard to know. Um, it's also clear there were only eight people in the study, and so the conclusion of the, this group is that the, if there had been 30% of controllers in this group, we, should, we could have potentially missed it because it's such a small group number. But we all have hesitations in repeating this kind of experiment, and I'll tell you why. So there have been other recent um, sort of rebounds of the Mississippi baby, which was a possible early cure, also rebounded after early therapy. So these are just kind of some of the reports, and this is the paper from Gentinot's group about the FIBIG-1 acute interruption. Even though you have a reduced viral reservoir, you have lower numbers of circulating cells with HIV DNA detectable in the blood, and lower evidence of inflammation and other deleterious outcomes, you still have viral rebound, so it's not enough for a cure. So. Um, early ART is still being pursued, but now really in combination with other approaches that may, along with lower viral reservoirs, actually be more effective. So uh, another approach, and this is being used in the acute studies, but also in people living with chronic HIV, are modifying viral latency. So I told you that the virus is integrated, so the red there is supposed to be the HIV DNA integrated into the host genome. So how can you possibly change the immune response to that virus, which, as I said, because it's not replicating in the setting of therapy, is not recognized by the immune system. So there have been efforts to use what are called latency reversing agents. These are agents that sort of unwind the chromatin, um, make uh, HIV be transcribed and expressed, to then release a little bit of virus release viral proteins on the surface of the cells with the hope that the immune system will then recognize and kill those cells that still have remaining virus. And um, there also have been latency suppressing agents. So this is the shock and kill model. You're trying to shock the virus out of latency and then recognize those cells and kill them. And there's another approach called block and lock model, um, which is you're going to actually put this, the cells deeper into latency. The idea with shock and kill is that you may also need some additional immune therapies to help the immune system recognize and kill those viruses. And I would say that just a major takeaway, here's a, another uh, kind of schematic of shock and kill. So you might have heard of valinostat or Saha, panobinostat, um, um, remidepsin, yeah. Um, so a variety of these uh, latency reactivating agents 
have been tried in a lot of clinical studies. Some of these have had some efficacy in, in releasing a little bit of virus that's detectable. Um, but in fact, none of these have actually shown a really an effect on the reservoir size. So you may be releasing a little bit of virus, but it may be that the immune system isn't really recognizing those cells as well. And so this really hasn't necessarily been effective. There's still ongoing studies, but more, most of these studies are now being used in combination with other agents to also boost the immune response. And then this is just a schematic of the lock and block model. Um, so this is the idea that you have a latency and latently infected T cell. You've already driven the viral load down to sort of undetectable in most of these people, although there may be some blips. But you're going to give something, in this case, TAT, which is an HIV protein. A TAT inhibitor may drive the, the virus even further into latency so that if there was going to be any kind of reactivation or inflammation or something that might in an otherwise well-treated person lead to a viral blip, that's never going to happen in these individuals because it's going to be so deeply sort of locked. Um, I don't believe there have been any clinical studies yet with these block and lock kind of approaches, and this is in development, but there's some um, nice in vitro data and some animal model data suggesting that this might be a useful approach. Um, I think the most sort of exciting new arena that people are talking about a lot for HIV cure are these immune-based therapies. And the idea here is that basically the same way you have circulating virus, you put somebody on therapy, and then when you stop therapy, you haven't necessarily tinkered with the latency of the virus, but you've tinkered with the immune system so that the immune system can control any sort of infected cell and, and prevent replication. So the idea here is that you're trying to do things that are gonna enhance the immune response um, and then lead to long-term HIV control, sort of like an elite controller, with the caveats that I talked about before. If you think about it, you're trying to rev up your immune system to control the virus, that may also have some long-term negative effects. Um, but so one of the really, really kind of popular things now that's being talked about is giving broadly neutralizing antibodies so these can basically enhance the ability of the host CD8 T cells to recognize um, the, the, the infected cells and also to then improve its cytotoxicity. So the CD8 T cells are the cytotoxic T cells that recognize infection and destroy CD4 cells. And in the cycle of untreated HIV, the reason you get CD4 decline is because your CD8 cells are attacking the CD4s and killing them. Um, but the, the good thing about BNABs is that you can actually help direct that so that you can actually be much more effective. And there have been some animal models using SIV, which to be clear is not HIV, and there are some major differences and also in the immune responses that have been very promising using some of these BNABs. Some of these are being done here at, um, in New York at the Rockefeller and, and elsewhere. Um, you can also use different other kinds of methods to improve the CD8 killing. Um, so there's something called IL-15 super agonist. This is something that basically sends T cells to the lymph node. And I showed you in the one slide with the animal model that the lymph node is a big site of HIV persistence. It's a big site of HIV replication. And the more you can direct the cytotoxic cells to the lymph node, especially at times of high viral replication, you may be able to better recognize and then address infected cells in that stage. There's also the concept of giving a vaccine that's gonna enhance both the CD8 T cell as well as the natural killer cell, NK cell response. And the idea here is that you're gonna basically um, do a better job where the virus is sort of maybe expressed at a very low level or there may be some low level proteins expressed that these cells are gonna be able to recognize. And finally, there are these CAR T cells which basically also are allowing um, different parts of VNABs, it's sort of an engineered cell that you can inject into people that have portions of VNABs that can uh, be attached to CD8 cells to, again, better recognize the latently infected cells. So the truth is that all of these have been studied in animal models, and some, some of them have actually had quite a marked sort of um, impressive show in terms of um, helping with viral control and looking at um, lowered reservoirs. None of these have clearly cured any animals, but I think that there's certainly a viral control that comes along with that. The effects of these have all been really hailed and ex as exciting, but I think when we talk about the language of talking to study participants about HIV cure, we have to make sure that we moderate how we're talking about the effectiveness of these, even in the animal studies, as we're trying to consent people for studies that would be involving these kinds of therapies. 
Um, and we'll talk about that more afterwards. And finally, um, I'm sort of like the stem cell transplant, this idea that you could maybe do gene therapy to change the cells that we have in our body so they don't have receptors for HIV could be another approach. And there have been some gene therapy uh, uh, approaches using zinc finger nucleases, which basically allow you to sort of go in and cut out certain genes in the human genome. And so you basically do leukophoresis, where you take out a large portion of the, of the blood cells, take out CD4 T cells, return the rest of the blood cells back to the body, manipulate CD4 T cells in the lab to use these zinc finger nucleases to cut out CCR5, reintroduce those into humans, those T cells again, and then hope that you've affected an HIV remission or cure. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of steps in that that make it very challenging to be effective on its own. How many T cells do you have to do this to? You can't possibly imagine that you're going to be able to do it to everybody. There's a lot of complications with taking out the immune cells and doing all these things. But the concept that you could perhaps manipulate genetically the, um, these approaches is something that I think is being used in a lot of different diseases and is, is promising, again, maybe in combination with also an enhanced immune function. So maybe you're going to lower the reservoir considerably by doing something like this and then enhance the immune system's ability to recognize the, the cells that are still remaining. But I think the biggest takeaway point of this is that every single one of these things I'm talking about are incredibly complicated to do, um, except for perhaps starting treatment early. But we know from a public health and treatment and provider standpoint, that's incredibly complicated to do. It's very, very difficult to identify people within the first weeks of therapy and start them on treatment right away. All of these other things involve major manipulations of the immune system, many of which have real risks. So for example, um, anti-PD-1 therapies, which is one way that we are, um, you're hoping to enhance the immune system's ability to recognize and kill the infected cells. These are therapies that are used a lot in cancers, these immunotherapies, and have been incredibly effective. But they're associated with a really severe sort of um, complications of autoimmune diseases because you're enhancing immune responses to the body. And in many cases, there have been reports in cancer, in people living with cancer, of severe autoimmune encephalitis, severe lung autoimmune responses, some of which are fatal. So you can imagine as somebody who's living with HIV, controlling the virus, um, what's the trade-off of going into a clinical study where you may potentially have the risk of that with possibly possibility of an incremental understanding of HIV reservoirs, for example. Um, and this one, again, all of these are things that really are quite involved and, and carry, I think, significant risks. Um, so I'm going to switch now to talking about um, antiretroviral treatment interruption and, and why we, we use this in studies. And I, I showed this in, in the initial slide where I showed people's viral rebound. But, but why treatment interruption? Isn't treatment interruption the opposite of what we're telling every single patient we've ever had to do? And this is one of my biggest concerns about it. But there is a reason that the cure field feels that it's so essential to do treatment interruption. And the reason why is that I mentioned that you can measure CD4 reservoirs in the blood. You can measure tissues all around the body. But for example, the Mississippi baby, that child had sampling of all sorts of different sites and everything. No virus was found in the gut. No virus was found in the lymph node. Uh, but still, th this baby wasn't cured. She rebounded. So in a way, what, what's been proven by all of these other cases, besides the Berlin patients so far, is that um, these biomarkers that we use to measure the reservoir size or look for latency are actually not accurate, that there is potentially virus hiding in places we're not looking that can still rebound. And so the only tool that we really have to assess whether or not a tr new intervention may be effective is to stop therapy and to see what, what somebody's body does. And this is being used sort of in, in, in two ways. One is to look at the delay and the time to viral rebound. And this was demonstrated in the figure that I showed you where people interrupted therapy and there was a longer latency to rebound. So this is potentially telling you that if you've had a longer delay to viral rebound, you've done something to affect either the immune system's response or control or the reservoir size. And then the other thing that's being looked at is this ability to be a post-treatment controller so that when you stop therapy, your body can then control viral replication on its own. And this is being shown, for example, in the Visconti study that I mentioned, many of those people actually rebounded initially, but then after they stayed off therapy for a while, then developed control. This presents challenges that I'm going to talk about. 
Um, this one's a little bit easier, I think, to, to use in studies. And this is another schematic that shows sort of the same idea. So if you have a normal uh, ART in pink is interrupted, and then with somebody who's had no interventions, we know that there's a big post-rebound viral load. It looks just like acute infection. There's a high peak, and it comes back down again. Some people actually um, get an acute retroviral syndrome during rebound, unfortunately. And then there's different things. So if you're trying to look at post-reactivation control, like the Visconti patients I talked about, they may have a normal time to rebound, but if you let them rebound, you can see that their viral set point is lower. They may have lower inflammation. They may have a better CD4 recovery. And then there's other people that we're, we're looking at something where there's a delayed reactivation. So some studies are sort of using both of these, where you're both looking for a longer time to rebound and then a lower set point afterwards. I think the issues uh, here, uh, yeah, sure. When the, uh, when the rebound is there, what does that mean in terms of infectiousness? It's incredibly high. It's incredibly high, high and I'm going to talk about that. So right, just the same way in acute infection, you have this the blue line as the viral load. So you, you, you just shoot up right away. You may later control. <laughs> um, but for example, this, this isn't the best picture because with these post-rebound viral control, you actually can have a really high inertial viral load and then later control. And so, so infectiousness is a major issue in these studies, and we're going to talk about that. Um, so there has been a lot of thought, I would say a little bit post hoc, a lot of attention to some of these issues that have been raised in terms of safety of using treatment interruption. Um, so you need both the investigators and the community to be involved in thinking about doing these kinds of studies. There really needs to be legitimate informed consent, and I think this is going to be a lot of the topic of Gail's talk, but how do you actually um, explain to someone in a way that you can ex really explain the risks, many of which are still unknown, of interrupting therapy? And how do you avoid coercion? How do you keep somebody from having false hopes of what their involvement in the study is going to do? And um, how do you get around the sort of everything that I showed you in the slide about the personal benefit from HIV cure? So many of things are so emotional. Many of the reasons people join these studies is they have sort of gut feelings that are totally understandable, but that we don't want to necessarily be enrolling them in a study with false hopes. Um, of course, you have to mitigate against risk in terms of doing treatment interruptions. And there was a, a group that got together last summer that had a whole day-long symposium about talking about ethics and safety of treatment interruption in HIV cure trials. And there's a nice report, the sort of consensus statement recommendations from that. Um, and so some of the things that people have talked about is you don't want to include anybody who's had a low CD4 nadir who could have a really quick drop, somebody who's had a history of cancer, coronary disease, HIV-associated dementia, any of these things that might be thought to really recruit us quickly. You have to have a high baseline CD4. There are age limits that are talked about. Um, this is a very complicated one. So people who are going to stop therapy. If people have a regular partner, can you get the regular partner on PrEP? Can you offer PrEP through the trial? But if you don't necessarily have a steady partner, what's going to happen to that individual if they're just living their life during the time they're interrupting therapy? How are we going to protect others against the risk? And then the restart criteria. So I mentioned the fact that some studies are just looking at the time to viral rebound, in which case restart criteria have been just as soon as any virus is detected, essentially, I'll show you on the next slide, they start treatment again because they don't want to have CD4 decline, they don't want to have complications, they don't want to have risk of transmission. But the problem is, is that there's, there's now a, an understanding that the post-treatment control is also something that's sometimes seen. And if you start treatment right away when somebody rebounds, you're not going to necessarily observe that they were able to control the virus with their immune system, especially with some of the current therapies that are really targeted more at post-treatment control than on getting rid of the reservoir. Um, is there any resistance <laughs> Stop and Resistance, you mean like um, that is a real concern. So, so far, the small study, so the study I showed you where people rebounded after treatment in a FEBIG one, they looked at resistance before and after, and they found no new resistance. But that study, and I'll show you on this slide, had a very, very strict rebound restart criteria. So, that study is a, was a study that had very closely monitored viral load criteria. So, they said they were checking twice a week in that study for the viral load to rebound. When it was identified as rebounding at, at 1,000, they rechecked it in two days, and they restarted people on therapy. 
So people basically did not have viral rebound for more than about a week in that study. I don't know the exact number of days, but it was a very short period of time of viral replication where, and then they were restarted on therapy. So in that study, they specifically looked at the emergence of resistance and there was none in eight people. Um, but the risk, the concern is there will be resistance. And there is, I think in, pretty sure that in one of the Boston patients um, who interrupted therapy, and I'm gonna show his slide in a minute, I do think that resistance was generated in that case. Yeah. Um, so that is something to really be concerned about as well. Yes, other complications resistance I have up here. Um, other, other restart criteria people have said, if you get an acute retroviral syndrome, if you have an opportunistic infection, if you have a CD4 decline, if you have pregnancy. But I think one of the most controversial questions is, this, is this, the viral load restart criteria. So these kinds of studies where you're just looking at viral rebound, the criteria have been really strict. But because new studies are suggesting that you may need to watch for control, there's now discussions of long-term high viral loads, watching to see whether or not people then can control after that. These are some of the criteria that have been talked about. And I'll tell you, I was at this meeting last summer talking about the um, safety of ATI studies and the, the biggest discussions and the most heated discussions were about these, this issue. How long do we really think it's safe to let somebody stay off therapy when everything we know, and everything I know about the brain in particular, which is where my experience is, tells you that you can develop inflammation, resistance, compartmentalization, and all sorts of clinical outcomes if you leave people off therapy for a long time. Um, but the reason that, that people are talking about this, this sort of sustained viremia, is from studies such as these. So this is a study that was done in the SIV model and in the CAC model, where uh, animals were um, iatrogenically given SIV and then were put on ART. And then those with the red were given placebo and then interrupted therapy. Those with the blue were given an anti-alpha-4 beta-7 inhibitor. So this is basically a, something that blocks um, cells from trafficking into the gut. And these animals overall, this is the average of a number of animals, had viral rebound, not quite to as high a level, but then actually had a pretty dramatic viral control after a long time. And the argument has been made is that if you had stopped the study here, you would not have recognized that there was a benefit to this intervention. And in fact, um, in follow-up, these animals have not been. Go ahead. In the discussion of what cutoff to use for viral load rebound, did any of the um, proposals include discussing it with the patient? That's a great that's a great question. Well, I'll tell you. So one of the best things about this meeting is there were a lot of very very um, actively involved community members. Actually, one of the planners of the meeting was a community member, and so a lot of the discussion was involving community members in terms of talking about how to put together these criteria. I think the challenge is is that on a in a in a study setting on a case by case basis, dropouts. I mean, people can always drop out. So at any time in a study, somebody could say, I don't want to do this anymore, I want to restart therapy. And of course they can. But there's so many pressures not to do that, I think, in reality, that a lot of people wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And I think making setting up a study where it's sort of a case-by-case -case basis for the patient to decide when to start therapy means that you're not going to necessarily get the endpoints you're looking for. But, but you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. And I think this is where the community engagement part is so important, because what are, and, and, and Gail is going to talk about this, you know, the risk to the person who's doing it and their understanding of what you're going to get out of this kind of data, I think is, is, is really the challenge. Go ahead. I, I thought on your initial uh, uh, slide, you was what you were getting to, and I'm looking at the time. I'm sorry. Uh, that, no, uh, that you would say, be saying something about uh, the resource, uh, the resources being devoted to this as compared to other interventions and whether this kind of work represents a uh, a diversion, given limited resources, from what else might be done. Yeah. Well, I'm actually not talking about that very much. I have a sort of a one point, which I think is an absolutely critical point. Um, but it is, I mean, it's sort of one of my very last points. I think, I think that's partly what I'm sort of, the overall picture here is looking at all of these studies worldwide, millions and millions of dollars millions of, I mean, lots of investigator effort. You know, this has become such a trendy area that a lot of leading people in the field are now saying, this is where I'm gonna put all my efforts for the rest of my career. You know, what's the trade-off of that? What are we missing and what are we losing? If we know that something like implementation science to just get people therapy mm -hmm. would change that whole 
you know, 90-90-90 cascade and would actually benefit a lot of people we know that works. And I think this is, this is, this is one of the problems. It's, it's a problem for the NIH. It's a problem for the Gates Foundation. It's problems for, for all of us. You know, what seems really exciting as a kind of laudable goal for one that's been achieved to one person out of 75 million versus what we know has worked for millions of other people. I, I think that's an incredible, we can talk about that, I think, with the, with the discussion. And I only have a few more slides, I hope. Um, this, is a, this is a paper that was the guidelines say, paper. In the next session, we'll uh, have time in the beginning if there are questions for you before Gail starts. Okay. Questions. That's great. Um, this is just the, the paper that came out of that that talks about these analytical treatment interruption. And uh, again, talking about the safety and the ethics, and, and I think this was a, a useful paper, but really it's just a tip of the iceberg. And I would also say, this is, except for it's the community members that were involved in this, but also the community members are very engaged in this field. This is pretty much written by HIV care researchers. So again, there is an inherent bias to say this is okay. And I, and I felt that when I was at the meeting, although I also think it's important. So I'm gonna end with some of these ethical and societal challenges. And I think that, um, again, Gail is gonna really follow on this. And this is, she's really the expert in this area. But these are things that, that either I've, I've known about or I have observed or I've been worried about just on a personal basis. So this is, this is one of my biggest concerns with antiretroviral treatment interruptions therapy studies, which is that, again, I spent the last 20 years of my career telling my patients that they should be starting treatment early, staying on treatment, not missing doses, I'm worried about their brains. I'm also worried about transmission and all these other things. And we are giving people a message to stop therapy um, where many people want to stop therapy. People don't want to be on therapy for the most part. I mean, some people feel much safer and more comfortable and it just makes them feel better. But a lot of people would love to be able to control the virus without therapy or just not have to worry about it. And I worry that encouraging ATI, promulgating these ATI studies sends a message that stopping therapy is actually okay. And this is an example of, of, of where I think where this kind of maybe came into play a little bit, although I didn't know this participant personally. But this is one of the two Boston cell transplant patients. So this individual was on suppressive therapy, adherent, seemed to be doing well, um, had a stem cell transplant, and, um, and, and then interrupted therapy um, with, you know, under guidance of his healthcare practitioners with lots of consent and all of that kind of thing had a viral rebound, actually had an acute retroviral syndrome with meningitis um, during that, and then got back on treatment, but then actually didn't really get back on treatment and didn't show up and wasn't on, got back on treatment again, stopped again, got back on treatment again. You know, how much of this was something completely different about the life circumstances of this person? But it's a little bit concerning that after a long period of time of being on suppressive therapy, which even allowed him to enter the study in the first place, had a lot of trouble with adherence, and then actually did develop resistance during the course of this period. So to me, this is a real life example of the fact that we may be confusing people or giving people false hope, um, by, and, and also you know, putting them through a lot of things that may lead to these kinds of outcomes, which are not ideal for this patient, I think. Um, the other thing is this is issue of risk of exposing partners to HIV. So again, the message is undetectable means untransmissible. Everybody should be able to feel comfortable with, um, you know, and also in the setting of PrEP, you know, we really, I think, tried to make people feel more and more comfortable with being sexually active and living their lives the way they want to live them and, and feeling safe and comfortable with that. But unfortunately, when you interrupt therapy, you can be viremic. At some point, you are going to have a rebound, as we've identified, and it can be very fast. It can be unexpected. You can have no symptoms. It can be very high. And so there's already been now a case report of an individual who was in a vaccine study. This is uh, just out, I think it's kind of in a preprint on JID, of an individual who came in, was in the vaccine study, interrupted therapy. This person is a HIV advocate, super, super well-informed, super knowledgeable, seemed to totally understand everything about the study, the risks, and everything. And then shortly after, the patient's partner came in with symptoms of acute retroviral syndrome, and all the genetic studies show that, that there was transmission between this person and his partner. And in this case, it seemed to be only through documented oral sex. But so there really was a, a um, I mean, this is what they reported. But in any case, during this period of treatment interruption, even with a very, very informed study participant who seemed like they knew all of the risks, still HIV transmission happened during the ATI portion of the study. 
Was it? Yes. Okay. And was that partner on the or no? No. 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 It was a female partner, not on prep. So again, I think they had discussed prep. I don't know why the partner wasn't on prep. But so one question that came up at this, at this meeting last summer, should prep be provided through these research studies? But again, you're not going to reach everybody by giving prep for one partner. But maybe at least you should provide prep to the partners through the research studies. I you have to to find your partner for a second. It might be a condition of being part of the study that you're part of the next I think that's so, a reasonable so, thought. So we have five minutes left. Okay. So maybe finish the slide and yeah. then we'll hold the conversation to the next session. Okay. I'm sorry to be running over. Okay. Um, risk of seroconversion during ATI. So this is in Thailand where I mentioned that having an HIV, positive HIV antibody test makes you sometimes unemployable. In the study of interrupting people with acute HIV and FIBIG1, this is the story. So these are the eight individuals. These people were all seronegative at enrollment. Two of them seroconverted despite early treatment. So this is just during treatment. But four more seroconverted during treatment interruption. So this is a really sad story because basically these people were living their lives at least HIV negative on paper for employment and probably also in terms of their own kind of cognitive state. And then because therapy was interrupted, they have enough, they had enough viral rebound to rev up the immune system and get an antibody response. So um, I'm just going to say here that I think in terms of ethical considerations overall regarding HIV uh, cure research, I think false hopes, using the word HIV cure, and we're going to talk about this more in Gail's talk. The risks of these interventions I already mentioned, risks of um, CAR T cells have, uh, have significant CNS risks for people. There's this, uh, risks of immunotherapies. These may be acceptable in people with, for example, an end-stage cancer diagnosis, but is it really acceptable in somebody who is otherwise living with well-controlled HIV? And then this is to your point, my only slide on this is that we're allocating available funding, available resources, available mind power, and community efforts into cure studies um, instead of all of these other things, prevention, adherence, mental health, comorbidity, treatment, implementation, science, and, and this one, which is the biggest problem I think we have worldwide. Um, this is all I can pretty much end here. This is from that same paper from uh, Dr. Dubé, this, what terminology the community might prefer for HIV cure, and I think this is a nice way to just stop and think. The term eradication is a misleading description of current HIV cure-related research. I think this is completely true. Instead, we call for the use of more realistic expressions such as sustained virologic HIV suppression or control or management of HIV persistence to describe HIV cure-related research. Using these terms reorients what HIV cure science can potentially achieve in the near future and avoids creating unrealistic expectations, particularly among the millions of people globally who live with HIV. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. I hope that we have time for discussion. After